Aloha, I'm Congressman Ed Case, and this is another one of my reports on public television. Uh, today I'm back in Hawaii for just a few days, and what I'm doing is a series of uh, Talk Story with Ed Case across the 1st Congressional District. Uh, we're here at Farrington High School where we're doing one of our five uh, this weekend. Uh, we are also doing uh, Talk Stories out in East Honolulu at Ainahaina. Uh, downtown Honolulu at uh, Central uh, Middle School, uh, tomorrow uh, out at uh, Waipahu at August Aarons, and then uh, Campbell High School down to Catch Eva uh, Beach and uh, Kapolei, trying to move right across uh, the district. Uh, for me, having these talk stories is really an incredibly important part of my job because I spend half of my time uh, in Washington, D.C. I spend six months out of the year plus in Washington. Uh, and the bottom line is when you're working in Washington and you're dealing with the, the, the concerns of the country and you're uh, dealing with the folks in Washington, uh, sometimes it's very easy to fall out of touch with the district uh, back at home. And uh, that's something that I swore I'd never do. Uh, and the only real way to stay in touch with the district, uh, to stay in touch with what folks are, are thinking, is to come home and spend time uh, in the communities where uh, you uh, live and work and play. And so that's what we do. Uh, come back uh, frequently, uh, try to do these community meetings. Uh, it's pretty open, as you will see uh, during this report. We'll show you some uh, glimpses of our talk stories. And, and then at the end of the show, I'll, I'll maybe give you a reflection or two on how it went. Uh, but uh, for me, it's uh, doing a couple of things. First of all, reporting back to folks on what I've been up to on their behalf. Uh, and the second part, and the most important part, uh, is to simply listen. And okay, good morning, everybody. I am uh, so incredibly grateful, uh, first of all, to so many of you coming out uh, to spend uh, a little bit of your uh, Saturday morning with uh, me and with your federal government and with your Congress. Um, first of all, let's just go back to the basics. Uh, my district is the first congressional district and that has 700,000 people in it, roughly. Uh, every single, remember that in our Congress, uh, two U.S. Senators for each state, but uh, each uh, uh, of the uh, states in the U.S. House of Representatives has the, the number of uh, uh, representatives depending on their population. Here in Hawaii we have two, uh, but all of those districts throughout our country, 435 of those districts have roughly 700,000, 710 people uh, in each. And that's what I've got uh, starting from Makapu'u Point, uh, way over on the east side, right through all of Honolulu, all the way out uh, to Mililani Mauka at the northern point and then down through Waipahu and, and Eva and Kapolei out to Koalina and Kahe Point. So I really have the city of Honolulu uh, proper. Um, and it is an incredible district. Uh, it is a district of incredible uh, diversity. Uh, for example, incredible uh, diversity in terms of you know where and how people live. Eth ethnically, it's one of the most diverse uh, districts in the entire country. Uh, it has uh, folks, it has one of the highest uh, per capita populations of veterans. It has one of the highest per capita populations of those that were naturalized citizens. Uh, it has one of the highest uh, populations of our military uh, anywhere in our country. Uh, it has many, many of the highest categories. And so uh, it is an incredibly uh, great district to represent. There are many districts throughout the country that are pretty homogeneous if you look at them. They don't differ whether you're up in the northern corner or the southern corner. Uh, frankly, this is the district that I'd far uh, uh, prefer uh, to represent. But. Uh, one of the things about uh, uh, representing the 1st Congressional District in Congress it is it one of the farthest away from Washington, D.C., uh, 5,000 miles, as a matter of fact. Uh, last year when I started campaigning, I started uh, walking throughout the district uh, and spending time in the district. And I remember one morning, uh, about 7 in the morning, I was uh, walking Kalama Valley. Uh, and um, it was a beautiful day, except roughly 50 to 75 helicopters went over Kalama Valley between 7 and 12, which is when I was canvassing. And I went, what the hell is going on? Uh, I really never, really fo never focused on it uh, before. And I thought, well, I, you know, it would be pretty tough to live under 50 to 75 helicopters going over um, uh, every day, especially 7 o'clock. This was a Sunday morning. So this was not Friday, this was Sunday. So I started to watch the helicopters a little bit more throughout the district, and then I started seeing them, you know, in Aina Haina, and I started seeing them uh, in Lower Manoa Valley, uh, coming very low. And then I started seeing them, uh, uh, especially out in Mililani, just kind of coming down the chute, right? Down from going around the island. And then it started happening in Kaneohe as well. 
And so then I started to talk about this a little bit more. And I discovered in terms of talking about it that there was um, a widespread concern uh, and growing concern with tour helicopters. Um, so one of the first things I did in Congress was to try to understand exactly what the legal regime was, the jurisdictional regime. And I'm gonna be overly, uh, I'm gonna get this, first of all, um, I have a full-on report from the Congressional Research Service, which I asked for, CRS, Congressional Research Service, um, is, a, um, uh, one, is, a, is an adjunct of the Library of Congress, and it is available, and its mission is to answer my questions, to help me with my job. You can ask them anything you want uh, as a member of Congress. Uh, and so I gave him a, a four-page uh, memo on tour helicopters. These are the questions I want you to ask. Who's responsible for the regulation? How, how do we, uh, you know, what, tour, what helicopters are loudest? Um, where else in the country have we limited tour helicopters? Um, what are the proposed legislative solutions? I have that memo, you're welcome to the answer. It's, a, it's an eye-opener in terms of, of the actual, uh, um, you know, law and regulations that apply. Um, and I can summarize it for you in about three sentences. First of all, the FAA says it has no authority to regulate for noise. All they're concerned about is, is uh, safety of operations. That's number one, in an open skies regime. So the regime we have in this country is open skies. Essentially, everybody can fly wherever they want unless they can't. So it's the reverse, right? Uh, so that's number one. Number two, uh, the, um, limit, the, the altitude limitation for two or helicopters is 1,500 feet. Um, but they can fly under 1,500 feet on visual flight path if they think there is a weather or a safety issue. This is a judgment by the pilot. Okay, so it's obviously honored in the breach since you can see on flight radar 24 that they're flying under 1500 all the time. Um, I, two weeks ago, had a personal conversation with the FAA regional administrator uh, in San Francisco about this and said, uh, this is a tremendous concern of mine. I'm not going away. Uh, how do we fix this problem? I'm happy to share, I just actually on Friday, uh, sent her a follow-up letter asking her a series of questions uh, to try to, in, to, to, try to um, uh, introduce uh, the community into this discussion. Um, this is going to probably take some combination of a regulatory and a legislative fix uh, to, to essentially uh, regulate tour hel helicopters as to noise, time, um, altitude, uh, you know, place. So when can you fly where? so as not to disturb uh, the ground. Um, <clears throat> I was home yesterday, I came home Thursday night, I was home yesterday to do some work at home. I had 50 over my house yesterday. <clears throat> so I know, what, I know what you're talking about. So you, you, I'm on this mission with you. Um, what I need from you, collectively, I need a lot more community voicing to this. I need to kind of rally everybody to this. Um, <clears throat> I don't think anybody else is really now you may feel you're doing, I'm talking about every neighborhood board out there. I'm talking about citizens uh, saying to their county and state legislators they want this fixed. Now you've got friends as you know who are on the Big Island. Um, if, you, if you want to go to a place that has it worse, uh, try Pahoa, uh, where they've had, um, at last count, 16,500 overflights in a year. So take that, it's 45 overflights a day, 365 days a year. Their life is hell over there. Um, so uh, we've got to kind of put, I'm early on on this, but that's, that we need a little bit of a coalition to happen. Uh, and when I go to the FAA and my colleagues in Congress, and by the way, in Congress, we have an open skies, I'm sorry, a quiet skies caucus. I talked earlier about getting together with folks that you agree with, that you can work with. It, and so I went looking for other people that have this uh, issue and I found a number of people that are already banded together in Open Skies Caucus. This goes to JETS as well. Uh, so I don't want to take too much time here because I've got some other folks. But what I need is a, is a, is a clear line of communication with you and everybody that believes in this. And I, I want to send to you uh, the CRS research uh, memo, which is about 15 pages long and my letter to the FAA, and I want you to um, 
get on your email list and, and circulate it so everybody's on the same page. And then we need to develop a, a little bit of a movement here. My job is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty clear on what my job is. My job is to uh, exercise my, um, my own judgment in consultation with my constituents about how best to uh, go about the business of governing our country. Uh, and I am also clear that my uh, responsibility under the Constitution is to act as a member of a separate, independent, and co-equal branch of government who has responsibility for checks and balances when appropriate. So I don't give any president a complete pass and I don't give any president my complete allegiance. That's not my job. My job is to think for myself uh, and, and to uh, you know, work with my colleagues uh, to do that. Uh, and so um, sometimes I hear this uh, uh, point made, um, like, uh, like many other points, in a very absolute extreme poll kind of way, as in investigate President Trump for just about everything investigate President Trump, not at all. Now, I don't believe in either of those. Uh, I believe that there is an appropriate role uh, for Congress to play in oversight. Uh, and so, uh, but I don't believe, uh, and I, let's take Trump out of this equation, because too often this discussion gets caught up in the Trump thing. He's a very, whether you support him or not, uh, he's a polarizing president. He drives people to extremes. And that's one of my objections with him. Um, you can, I remember serving, I was, in, I was in Congress the last time under President Bush. Now President Bush was a pretty strong uh, president, he said what he thought, but I don't remember him being quite this polarizing. So this complicates things uh, in Congress because it clouds reason and independent judgment. Um, I think that there, uh, some of what is being um, undertaken in Congress from a from a, an investigation perspective right now <coughs> is a legitimate concern with checks and balances. But if it goes over the edge <coughs> into purely for political purposes, purely to destroy the reputation of the president, purely as a workup to the presidential elections of next year, that's where I take issue with my own party. Uh, so that's the balance that I'm trying to find here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to cede my, 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 my constitutional obligations to oversee this president or any other president. But I don't think that I, uh, I don't think that it, it um, it's a power that is too, too, too subject to abuse. And so that's the fine line that finally, frankly, I walk inside my own caucus as a Democrat. And by the way, I'm not alone. Uh, so you think of the Democratic caucus as being some monolithic thing and everybody thinks alike. That's not the way it is at all. We have a pretty broad uh, spectrum of, uh, of, of, of opinion on this exact subject. So <clears throat> I would like to give you some, I actually can't do this, but if I could give you an insight into the discussions inside our Democratic caucus meetings, you would see that we, um, we discuss uh, the proper balance from this perspective. Well, if, if I left you the impression that for me, uh, securing our borders is not related to safety, that's not correct. I believe that securing our borders on balance is the right of any country for a lot of different reasons. Safety is one of them. Um, and certainly um, with safety also, just the overall decision about who gets to come into our country and why. And we have a longstanding policy, as do many other countries, that we don't, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, allow hardened criminals, if I can put it that way, to, to come into our country uh, legally. So I completely accept uh, your, your, your basic point uh, that uh, securing our border is, is, is about safety. Um, I will say one thing though, uh, because a lot of times some, somebody throws something out and pretty soon everybody believes it's true. Uh, but if we talk about, for example, uh, a border wall to prevent the entry of illegal drugs into our country, uh, we, know, we know that that's not how those drugs come over the border. They usually come over, the, the vast majority of them come through ports of entry. So Long Beach, Miami, Galveston, et cetera. So, you know, for me it's always about, let's get the facts straight before we make the decisions. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find the facts in the, in the noise machine. Uh, so, but that, that's a side note to your basic point. Now. Um, let me be clear that again, um, my answer is that there, and the border security, the border patrol has, has said this, uh, they don't necessarily believe that a 2,000 mile 
physical barrier across the entirety of that border is the way to secure the border. They, they, they will agree that there are other ways to secure parts of the border that simply aren't very porous right now. Like for example, let's say you're at the top of a mountain ridge overlooking the Rio Grande. Well, it's hard enough to get there to start with. So why spend those monies on a, on a wall there when that money could be better uh, invested in uh, some other type of technology or border security that will do the job better? Uh, than doing it there. So, so getting into this kind of, you know, thinking like, oh, well, it's got to be a 2,000 mile border wall or nothing. I don't know. To me, that, that doesn't uh, work. That's not what he's asking for. It's a partial wall just to come and using other Correct. Yes. Well, no, that's not what he has said. He has said he wants a 2,000 mile wall. Now, more recently, and by the way, Congress funded uh, the partial uh, wall that, that the president wants. So we funded, we funded uh, two to three billion dollars uh, for, for partial physical barriers on the border in the most uh, problematic areas. So it's not like Congress is saying no. Congress is saying no, well, well let's take care of the immediate problem and then figure out how to, how to solve the bigger problem. So that's where the disagreement has been is whether we need you know, a full on wall. But anyway, uh, the, point, the point I'm trying to make to you is that I agree with you in general. Uh, and um, I, think, I think we just have to find the best, most cost-effective way of actually securing, securing that border. Okay, we got time for one more. Uh, it is one of the highest things on my priority list, and I believe that that's correct with the rest of the delegation. Um, we have to get the right solution to take care of, and Helen is exactly right. Uh, when you think about uh, uh, the, the, the um, aquifer, so that's the water underneath us, that's where we get our drinking water. Uh, the aquifer that uh, is underneath and serves uh, central Honolulu, really. Uh, so all the way from here, out here, all the way to uh, right past Red Hill. Uh, that is the aquifer that we're talking about. So that, that, uh, those fuel tanks are sitting over that aquifer. And so it's obviously a critical um, issue, critical, critical issue. Um, there are some solutions that might work and some that in my mind probably won't work. Uh, so again, my commitment is to continue to make it the highest priority. Um, and we, again, it's a very difficult, it's one of those most difficult situations you get because both sides of the issue have entirely uh, legitimate reasons. Uh, for the military, a critical part of our entire uh, military uh, activity is the entirety of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the major uh, fuel storage facility uh, between the mainland U.S. and Africa, right here. Uh, so it's major for the military, uh, and it's major for our community. So yes, it is a very high priority. Uh, great talk story. I really appreciate that. It was really wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. For Okay, well, that was our second uh, great talk story at uh, Aina Aina in, in East Honolulu. Uh, a lot of folks coming out on a beautiful uh, uh, Saturday morning uh, here in, here in uh, Aina Aina. Uh, great discussion of a lot of really interesting uh, and, and important issues. Uh, Wailupi Stream uh, uh, was top of mind to many, many of the folks here. Uh, we've been working on that with the community. Um, talked about uh, just a um, critical uh, decline in uh, peace of communities uh, through tour helicopter noise and I told them that I was already on board on that and working very hard on that um, and um, a host of issues on the national a lot of uh, good discussion of uh, immigration and what we need to do with immigration in our country and uh, as often happens uh, at one of these meetings uh, somebody says hey we've got another community event going on uh, so I'm on my way down to uh, talk to the uh, uh, volunteers at the Aina Haina Public Library. Uh, they've been working for over a year to fix the library and, and uh, the folks that work there came to my talk story and said, hey, can you come down and 
and uh, kind of uh, say thanks to the volunteers. And I said, sure, I'll do that before we go off to uh, Farrington for our Kalihi talk story. Uh, so uh, check in later. We don't want you to see. That's clearly a tour helicopter. Major issue, uh, major issue today, uh, tour helicopters, uh, 40 to 50 overhead in East Honolulu uh, every day, usually in the morning. Uh, just checking one going by right now, and, and uh, you can actually uh, check it out on Flight Radar 24 app. And so um, I watch it to see what's actually happening with the uh, tour helicopters, and I can see a bunch right now. Uh, clearly not, uh, not complying with the uh, altitude limit uh, at all. How are you? Uh, Ed Case, yeah, good to, you. good to see you. Nice to see you all. Uh, howdy. All right. Oh, wow. Hi, aloha. Ed, Ed Case, I was uh, just doing a community meeting up the street, so uh, uh, Sharon asked me to come by and uh, say hi. Yeah, wow, this is fantastic. Wow, look at this. Really, really beautiful. Ah. When I decided to go back into Congress, uh, or to, to, to seek to go back into Congress, I should say, uh, not even a year ago, uh, my major motivation was a feeling that our government was uh, going in completely the wrong direction. Uh, incredible partisanship, incredible polarization, nobody talking to each other. Um, too much insider trading. Uh, so too few people controlling the levers of power, money, and influence, leaving out virtually all citizens of the country. Uh, so a very, very small group inside Washington, and this was a function of a lot of different things, but it was especially a function of lax ethical rules, uh, lax campaign spending and campaign finance uh, uh, rules, which created uh, a, a, um, an incentivized and, and rewarded uh, a system that was simply leading to tanking of public opinion. Uh, and I felt that, and I'm sure you all felt it uh, too. Um, and so um, my commitment was to uh, go after this right away when I got back, if I got back, which I did. And so it was clear when I got back that uh, many, many of my colleagues had heard the same thing out in their uh, communities. They had, they had gone into, into government for the same reasons. Uh, they had the same marching orders from the folks that elected them as I did. Fix it. You know, let's get government fixed and working again. And so one of the very first things we did, in fact, it was the first thing, was to introduce HR 1. HR is a bill, a proposal, and they go sequentially. So one means that's the very first one that was introduced into this Congress. It was a sweeping reform effort, that first time we've had that in a generation at least. And so uh, we worked very hard at getting that passed the House, and it was passed. The For the People Act made major changes, and I was uh, very involved in that effort, including um, offering successfully a, an amendment uh, when the bill came to the full floor to really bring back small dollar donors uh, who had been really drowned out by this avalanche of big money. So, uh, you know, my, my thinking, and I think, I hope you would agree, is that um, everybody should be participating in the system, including, uh, including uh, folks that uh, give of their time and money to a political campaign. And if you don't have anybody but the big ones doing that, then what do you expect from a result? Uh, so that was a major part of uh, my effort. Um, here are a couple of examples of, of how we can help. Uh, in this, uh, these are just from the last couple of weeks, uh, people that came in to, for some, some help. You know, one just has with some basic, uh, you know, the Internal Revenue Service. Sometimes you just don't get your tax refund fast enough and nobody's giving you an answer. We are happy to try to get you an answer. Uh, sometimes the federal government, or state or county for that matter, um, don't always get, uh, get to, to uh, folks that just kind of call their, their line right away, but they will get to a member of Congress if the member of Congress asks. Um, and um, I am fine using that, um, that uh, position and influence to get people answers. Uh, so clearly we've done that with some folks that just, their tax refunds got lost. Um, in the case of Veterans Affairs, I talked about uh, them needing a lot of help with individual issues. In one case we had, uh, we had a Korean War veteran who had lost his hearing as a result of his service. He needed a hearing aid. 
Uh, but he hadn't been able to get an appointment uh, with the VA to get that hearing aid <coughs> set up for years, which is not acceptable uh, as a matter of policy. <coughs> anyway, uh, his kids came to us. He was too proud to come to me, or maybe he didn't know that he could, but his kids uh, knew that, uh, you know, that he could. And so they came in, asked us for help, and we got him an answer and, and a new hearing aid inside of about uh, four weeks or something like that. So we, we, we all felt good about that result. Another one uh, which kind of uh, puzzles me even to this day, immigration. Um, so we had a, we had a constituent, a, a resident of Hawaii who was engaged to a woman, as I recall, from, um, um, let's see, Taiwan. She was from Taiwan. And she had to do some paperwork in, in, in the consulate. Uh, and the consulate said, send your paperwork to Thailand. Why? I don't know. Why would they send it to Thailand if, if everything was happening in Taiwan? In any event, they did. And so, and then they didn't hear anything back. And then finally they said, hey, can you help us out? And we figured out uh, paperwork. And they had told her uh, that she needed to go to Taiwan, which she always did to start with. But they were going to charge her an excessive amount of money and time uh, to take the paperwork from Thailand and transfer it over to Taiwan. So they came to us and we said, hey, that's not right. It's your mistake, not hers and his. Uh, so situation solved. Uh, she got to go to the, uh, uh, the consulate in Taiwan. Uh, paperwork, no charge for the transfer. So uh, perhaps a small thing in the big picture, right? But the most important thing to those folks, the most important thing, uh, the one time that they probably wanted some help from their, from their federal government. And that was my obligation to help them out. And let me start by saying that I do believe uh, that our climate is being negatively affected by man-made activities. Uh, so I am I'm not a skeptic as to uh, uh, the fact that uh, because we have significantly increased our, our carbon footprint over especially the last 25 years, it has had an impact in our environment. Um, and, it, um, and I'm prepared uh, to accept the overwhelming uh, view of uh, the scientific community that this is a serious uh, issue. If I had half the community saying one thing and half the community saying the other thing, then it'd be a different story, but that's not the case. Um, we do have the scientific community basically. Now, whenever you have a problem, um, you've got two problems with that problem. The first is, are you going to acknowledge you have a problem? And second is, what are you going to do about it? And I think that uh, in this particular area, uh, we have had a situation where uh, because, the, because what we have to do about it is such a complicated and difficult uh, fix, uh, the answer of some folks is to say there's no problem to start with. And that's no way to run a government or any other uh, situation. So I'm pretty you know, wide-eyed realistic about it. Um, and um, frankly, uh, most people don't realize this, but some of the some of the best evidence of, of actual climate change comes from um, uh, scientific uh, research in Hawaii, which is regarded as world-class leading. And I'm talking about Mauna Loa. Uh, on Mauna Loa, on the big island where I was born and raised, um, there is an observatory that's been there for 60 years now. And every year they measure how much uh, 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 carbon dioxide is in the air. Uh, and they have seen a market spike like this going up very rapidly. Uh, over those 60 years. Now, it's hard to deny that, uh, in all honesty. You can deny uh, whether the fact that there is uh, carbon in the atmosphere uh, actually is causing, uh, you know, uh, um, um, some of the consequences that we worry about, like, like um, you know, uh, excessive temperature or storms or, or climate, I'm sorry, uh, sea levels uh, to rise. Uh, personally, I think it is. Uh, but it's easier to argue about that than it is about whether we actually have carbon in the air. So I believe it is an international uh, issue, crisis, if I can put it that way. Um, as you well know, uh, uh, our country has uh, not participated in uh, some of the international conventions, uh, which would get us on the same page uh, with the rest of the world. Um, and that is probably why you can't find a carbon market uh, in Hawaii, or for that matter, uh, in, in the United States, because um, uh, that, that regime that's set up around international conventions and agreements on respecting uh, carbon exchanges um, is, is not really applicable to our country. So uh, there are many tough solutions that we have to uh, dig, our, uh, you know, dig our hands into, and this is, this is clearly one of them. So um, uh, you know, I don't want to get political about it, but I do want to be realistic about it. Uh, and frankly, I think that um, in a very short period of time, I've, I have seen 
um, a real um, acknowledgement of the problem for the first time. And you know, uh, one of the areas, for example, uh, this, is, this is sometimes a big surprise uh, to folks, but one institution in our country is really taking the lead on advocating uh, for the consequences of climate change and for a fix. What would you think that is? Our military. Our military believes that climate change is, is a threat to, to national security and military readiness because of the consequences of, 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 of things like flooding and sea level, sea level rise on military installations and military uh, training, et cetera, et cetera. So they actually just put out a report about four months ago on what military installations around the country are impacted by climate change related or what they believe is climate change related consequences uh, of which many of the installations here are on that list. So you could, Pearl Harbor is an easy one because if sea level goes up by you know six inches or a foot that does in, in fact impact our, our ability to use uh, Pearl Harbor. But they have Schofield Barracks on that list for example because of the change in the training environment. Very simplistically what the Jones Act says is that when you uh, ship goods between uh, to U.S. ports, you must use U.S. shipping, uh, U.S. flagged shipping. So for the most part built in the U.S. and flagged in the U.S. and manned in the U.S. and all that kind of stuff. Um, sounds like good law. Uh, good solid reasons for it. Um, um, uh, uh, trying to ensure that U.S. law is complied with. Uh, trying to make sure that we have a U.S. merchant marine fleet. Uh, trying to be sure that we have a a, um, a um, backup plan in the case of, uh, of a military uh, need. Uh, however, the problem is we don't have too many U.S. shipping, U.S. ships. If we had a really big uh, U.S. Uh, merchant marine uh, fleet with a lot of different companies competing with each other, uh, then uh, maybe uh, the act might be more palatable. But the problem that we have is that uh, we have very, very few uh, shipping companies that are Jones Act shippers, and as a result, in all honesty, they run a monopoly. Um, and this is especially true um, for an island state like Hawaii. So think about it this way. Let's say, let's say that you, uh, you want to take your, your, um, your oil uh, from Texas up to uh, New York. Um, U.S. ports, right? So Galveston, Texas. New York City, New York. Um, you must use U.S. ships. Now, if those shipping companies get out of whack and start to cost, charge you an arm and a leg, what are you going to do? You got trucks, you got trains, uh, planes, not really, but um, you got alternatives. So what does that do? It keeps the prices down. We don't have that option. And as a result, when you're in an island state, um, if a shipping company gets a hold of your lifeline, um, you're going to pay extra. That's exactly what has happened uh, here in Hawaii. Uh, we, uh, we only have two uh, shipping companies. Uh, their prices are about the same. They don't really exert any, any material competition on each other. Why? Because they're both doing perfectly fine charging higher rates. Um, and um, there's all kinds of studies. Everybody is trying to figure out, well, how much does this actually cost? Well, you know, it could cost 10, 20 plus. A uh, gallon of milk at the store, you know the story as well as I do. Uh, go buy it on the mainland, a lot less. Um, that's shipping. Um, so uh, I have believed for a long time now that the Jones Act really, really hurts a state like Hawaii. Uh, and that we don't have to repeal it across the entire country, but we have to make a special allowance for a state like Hawaii that gets caught up in it. Uh, you know, the other uh, uh, island parts of our uh, um, country uh, suffer the same fate, really. So you talk about Guam or or, you know, Puerto Rico or, or those kind of uh, places, even Alaska, because it's so far, they get a lot of theirs by ship. And so um, I did introduce the uh, Jones Act uh, reform legislation. Now this is an area where I am completely outnumbered in the congressional delegation and in most of the political establishment of Hawaii, uh, who various, who for various, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, policy, uh, political and uh, other kinds of reasons has been a supporter of uh, the Jones Act uh, for many years. Some of it goes back to the historical uh, 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 relevance of the ILWU on the waterfront and there's other reasons. 
Uh, so I'm the only person in the delegation and, and have been the only person for some time. The only other one that felt this way was Charles DeJou who served about nine, nine months. Uh, uh, yes, I am planning on continuing that. Now, I don't hold out a lot of hope that you know, I'm gonna be able to get the Jones Act amended in the next, next six months. This is a long-term play for me. Um, I need a few more people to start believing the same way in office with me. Um, but I also believe that by simply talking about the issue, by simply highlighting the issue, uh, I exert some kind of a control on the shipping companies because you know, no, monop no monopoly or duopoly likes the light to be shined on it. So it's my way of shining the light. This has been a great talk story. I really appreciate um, all of your uh, time, uh, great uh, questions, a great discussion. I hope you've taken something away uh, with you uh, uh, from, from today. Um, I welcome your feedback. Uh, I welcome you, your participation, and I, and I, and I hope to uh, see you again soon. So thank you very much. Well, we're here in uh, Waipahu, the third day of my uh, talk story series uh, this time around. Uh, great uh, two days to start with, uh, Central uh, Middle School, uh, downtown, uh, Friday night, and then uh, two great talk stories yesterday, one in East Honolulu and one in uh, Kalihi. Uh, and now here we are at August Aarons and Waipahu, moving off to the west side uh, here and then uh, down to uh, Eva Beach in Kapolei uh, this afternoon. Um, really incredible uh, groups that we've talked to so far, but uh, you know, what really just always amazes me about my district, even though it's a pretty small district, only about 40 miles from Makapu'u to uh, Ko'olina, is the incredible diversity when you move through the district. Uh, so many different uh, folks, so many different communities, uh, so many uh, different uh, areas that need to be represented, and uh, what I'm really looking uh, forward to in this talk story um, and the one this afternoon is what are the common areas throughout my entire district? Already I can see that regardless of whether you're in Central or East Honolulu, you're concerned about the state of our country, uh, you're concerned about the direction you want a better way forward, and I'm sure that I'll hear that here too. But uh, we also heard concerns that were perhaps more focused on those communities, and I'm looking forward to how we can assist uh, Waipahu and, uh, and Eva and Kapolei and the areas on the west side of my district. So uh, it'll be interesting to to get to the end of these talk stories and, and look back and, and, uh, and, and uh, tell you what, what I heard and what I learned. Well, look who showed up at our uh, Waipahu uh, Town Hall, uh, Jimmy Nakatani, uh, my district director when I served in Congress uh, the last time, uh, 2002 to 2007. <laughs> I think it's important for me to talk about my, my mission statement. Um, you know, We've got some former military people here. We've got uh, you know, elected officials. We've got uh, uh, a University of Hawaii uh, uh, administrators. And we, every one of you has, has some position of responsibility and, and some goals. And any person that's in that situation ought to be able to identify what their mission is. I've got three parts to my mission. Um, the first part is to contribute to national leadership. Um, my job, my real constitutional obligation as a member of Congress is to be a national leader, if you think about it. Uh, Congress is a separate, independent, and co-equal branch of government. Separate, separate, separate. <laughs> independent, independent, independent. Co-equal, really good word, co-equal, co-equal. I am not you know, above the president, I'm not below the president. I am co-equal. And I have an obligation, and by I, I mean as a member of Congress, we, and I mean I, because I am a member of Congress. And so I'm responsible for discharging the duties of Congress under our Constitution. Uh, and that is to lead our country, to make the right decisions for our country. Uh, obviously, we would like all to get on the same page between the executive and the legislative and the, and the, and the courts telling us that we're, you know, we're okay under the Constitution and go out and lead our country in a, in a way. That's not the way it uh, always works. Uh, we have checks and balances. And so we have to work our way through national leadership. It's a complicated and messy process a lot of the time. Nonetheless, my job is to be a national leader. So if that part of the job requires a lot of focus on policy, on proposals, on, on work in, 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 in committees, on fleshing out what we think is the right thing to do, um, on trying to forge uh, consensus relationships, and on voting. When you have to vote, you have to make a choice, right? So that's part of my job, a very important part of my job. The, the second part of my mission statement is to help Hawaii. And so from this part of the mission statement, uh, what I'm trying to accomplish is to utilize our federal government in a way that will benefit what we need here in Hawaii and will not hurt 
us unwittingly. Uh, sometimes our federal government is well-meaning, but because of the diversity in Hawaii, uh, they don't always get exactly how uh, to make it work um, in Hawaii. And I'll give you one perfect example from my, my past service. Uh, I had a veteran come in to talk to me. Uh, uh, he, he needed some uh, care at uh, Tripler. And um, the, the, uh, the Veterans Administration will reimburse a veteran uh, within a certain range, mileage range, uh, to get from the veteran's home to Tripler to get, to, to get veteran's care. And the veteran said, um, hey, I, I, I'd love to get, I need to get to the hospital, but the, 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 mileage, the mileage reimbursement is too low. It's way too low. And they're not going to pay me what it cost me to travel to the, to the hospital. And I said, oh, well, let me look into you. So I called up the VA. And I said, uh, hey, VA, what's the problem here? You know, my veteran is, is trying to get to the hospital and you're only reimbursing him X amount of, uh, you know, dollars for based on your mileage schedule and it's going to cost him three times that much to get to the hospital. And the VA said, well, what's the problem? That, that's our mileage reimbursement. And I said, the problem is he lives on another island. He cannot simply drive. This gentleman lived on Lanai. Now, the VA didn't think about the fact that maybe you had islands and it might cost more in that situation. Well-meaning. Uh, but it just didn't work. Now take that on a macro level and talk about, for example, uh, the challenges of, of, um, of education in a multi-ethnic society. The challenges of education in a society where you have one of the highest levels of naturalized citizens who take an, an, you know, an extra level of adjustment. Um, and you can see pretty soon that, that sometimes it, uh, you, you need to work a little bit to get uh, programs working just right. So, Helping Hawaii uh, with, with our needs um, is important. Um, the federal government funds roughly 20% of our, our total state budget, about $3 billion, uh, comes from the federal budget, uh, federal, federal government, one way or another. Um, the largest portions of that are you know, uh, uh, Medicaid, uh, which is you know, health care for the folks that fall through the gaps. Um, and uh, transportation is a big area. Uh, and education. Those are the three areas where our federal government is particularly involved uh, with us here in Hawaii. Uh, and that is, by the way, not including our military here in Hawaii. So that's kind of off that budget. Those are not funds directly to the state, but that is military spending, which is our second biggest economic driver uh, in the state. So I spend a lot of time on, on military issues. Uh, the third part of my mission statement is to help individual people with their issues. I already spoke to this a little bit when I referred to casework. Uh, not named after me. It's, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, um, it's like you know, a doctor opens a case, a lawyer opens a case. Well, in Congress we refer to, you need some help, uh, we try to help you. Uh, that could be any number of things. How's it going? Okay. Yeah? Hi. Yeah, good to, good to get out to have a beach. <laughs> How's the benches? <laughs> the benches aren't so bad, huh? Yeah. yeah. I, I, live my, I, li I live my life in uh, cafeteria benches. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead. Thank you, uh, Aloha. And so one of the areas that, uh, that is a very important part of one's foundation uh, in Congress, especially on the national leadership side, is what, what committees do you serve on? Uh, because in Congress, uh, we do a lot of our work in committees. Uh, so we delegate work into separate subject committees, a veterans committee, um, a housing committee, an agriculture committee. Uh, but there are a couple of committees that are particularly important because they're across the board, and one of them is appropriations. And that is one of the most uh, important and coveted and uh, valuable and influential committees in Congress. And it's a very simple uh, uh, reason, it because, it, because it determines where federal monies are going to be spent, all federal discretionary monies. Um, that's about $1.4 trillion a year. And the Appropriations Committee in the House is where all of that starts because we start the annual funding process in the House, not in the Senate. Starts in the House with appropriations, goes to the Senate, goes to the President. Um, I was appointed to that committee this time around, which in all honesty came as a real, uh, uh, obviously very pleasant, uh, but nonetheless a surprise. I was not um, expecting uh, that, but uh, through a, um, uh, a fortuitous uh, confluence of events, if I will uh, put it that way, um, I ended up on appropriations. Uh, really, really a critical committee for Hawaii. Last time Hawaii has had somebody on appropriations in the House uh, was 30 years ago with uh, uh, then-Representative
Representative Dana Kaka. Uh, and what made that a particularly uh, valuable time for Hawaii uh, when he was on the House was that Senator Inouye was on the Senate Appropriations Committee for decades and decades. And so a small state like Hawaii has really got to leverage its resources every chance we get. I can't go like California, you know, they have they have uh, delegation meetings and they all get together to talk about something of, ish, of in interest to California. They're already talking about over 10% of all representatives. So that's a pretty good critical mass. I got two. Uh, and I've got, you know, four if you add the two senators. So it's a small delegation and you've got to be able to leverage wherever you can what you've got. Uh, and so um, there was, it was incredibly valuable when uh, Inoue was on one side and Akaka was on the other because they got to coordinate appropriations and work back and forth and, and have those very practical discussions like, okay, well, why did you take the lead on this particular issue? And then I'll, I'll help you out there and I'll take this issue and then we'll work, you know, we'll work this particular uh, committee chair and this particular member. Um, and in this case, uh, it's very fortunate because Senator Schatz is on appropriations on the Senate side. Uh, so this is a, a, a good, solid uh, team. Uh, so together with uh, uh, Senators, uh, uh, Senator Hirono and Congresswoman Gabbard, uh, we have in fact been focusing very much on coordinating our efforts on appropriations. Uh, so couldn't be happier with that. Um, the other committee that I'm very happy with is Natural Resources, uh, a committee that I'm personally passionate about because I'm personally passionate about protecting our natural resources, whether it be our air or our land or our, especially our oceans. Uh, and natural resources are responsible for all of that. So our national parks, our national monuments, all of that is within natural resources. The other area that natural resources is, 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 is responsible for, which is of particular relevance to Hawaii, is Native Hawaiians, because the Natural Resources Committee has uh, jurisdiction over all the indigenous peoples, uh, and Native Hawaiians are indigenous peoples. And so uh, these programs are really, really uh, important, uh, not only to the Hawaiian community, but to Hawaii. They translate into uh, quite a fair bit of actual federal funding uh, that is of assistance uh, directly to Native Hawaiians, but indirectly to all of us, I believe. Uh, so that's a valuable opportunity for me to work there. Another area of uh, foundation for me, besides my office and my committees, um, is my relationships. Um, again, going back to the point, I'm one of 435. I'm from a small delegation. I don't have a natural tie to the California delegation or the Texas delegation or New York. I don't have a 55 member delegation meeting. It's two of us. Uh, and I have to forge relationships with other members, including members across the aisle, members of the other party, including members that maybe I don't have a whole bunch in common with. But there's gonna come a time when we do have something in common and I want them to know who I am and I wanna know who they are. And I want to know what they're interested in and I want to know, I want them to know what I, I'm interested in. How, how can we work together? Uh, this is just a natural, uh, uh, a natural um, uh, procedure in a, in a deliberative body where I'm not the dictator. I've got to work with other folks. I've got to be able to form a team. Now, in Congress, um, this is actually um, pretty widespread. You would think that this never happens in Congress. But there are many opportunities when actually underneath the radar screen of the, of the inside the beltway uh, you know, noise machine, there's a lot actually going on on another level, uh, trying to develop those relationships. I'll give you a very good example, and it, it, it relates to something I'll talk about later on. Um, I'm on the Military Construction Veterans Affairs Committee subcommittee of appropriation. So we are responsible for the entire uh, military construction budget across the entire world. And we're also responsible for the Veterans Administration, uh, all of their um, efforts. And that is an incredibly nonpartisan uh, committee. A beautiful uh, working relationship with, now we're gonna disagree on a couple of issues every once in a while, but not very many. Uh, and for example, I'm about to go on a congressional delegation with that particular subcommittee, a delegation, both Republicans and Democrats, to, to go down. We have jurisdiction over some of our veteran cemeteries and some of our military installations, so we'll go to, the, we'll go to Asia in a couple of weeks uh, to, to uh, make sure that our veteran cemeteries are being upkept well and that our military uh, construction is, is focused on what we need to focus on. Um, but that's a good example of how you've got to get to know uh, folks. And I spent, I've spent a lot of my first couple of uh, weeks here in just developing relationships, wherever I can. Uh, sometimes it's a little more formal, like in caucuses, which uh, caucuses are, 
where members come together on areas of, of common interest. Uh, you know, there is, for example, uh, the Congressional Oceans Caucus, the Congressional Tourism Caucus, the Congressional uh, uh, Asia Pacific American, American Caucus. These are collections of members that come together. So I've identified the ones that I think are important uh, to me and to Hawaii, and I've joined them. So trying to develop those relationships. So good solid foundation, lots of work still to do from my perspective uh, for me to have that good solid foundation going forward, but I'm, I'm happy with where it is um, so far. Um, I, I know what my duty is, um, and I, um, I have um, uh, agreed with what Speaker Pelosi has said, which is that you know, one of the most uh, critical decisions any member of the U.S. House can make is impeachment. And um, let's recall that impeachment starts in the House. If the House doesn't pass articles of impeachment, it goes nowhere. Uh, that's our responsibility. If we charge, the Senate then has a trial and decides whether to convict. The Senate never gets there unless the House gets there first. Uh, and I have not seen, um, and, and I consider that to be one of the most critical decisions uh, that any member of the House in any party in any time in our history could ever make. So I take it very, very seriously. But having said that, I am not, absolutely not shy about uh, exercising uh, uh, of that uh, responsibility if I think it's warranted. So I'm not, I'm not scared of the decision. Uh, but as I see the facts as they stand today, I don't think it's there. Uh, but I agree with you that it's extremely troubling on many fronts. And so, um, although perhaps it doesn't add up to that for me right now, um, maybe it will. Um, maybe it be the Mueller report or something else that we don't even know about today. Um, it's my responsibility and I will discharge it. Uh, so I'm not, uh, so if you're asking me, am I taking this seriously? I'm taking it very, very seriously. Uh, I, I would make a comment to you that um, that um, one can provide national leadership to include moral leadership without yelling and screaming on the, the evening news all the time or on social media. And I think that's what's been lost uh, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the noise. Uh, there are lots of very, very well-meaning folks uh, who are not the folks that get all of the publicity on either side, uh, who are um, uh, very conscious of their responsibilities as members of Congress. And they go about their work every single day. And those are the people that are gonna decide this. Uh, and I count myself as one of them. Uh, so so uh, please don't mistake my, my not yelling and screaming about uh, you know, our president or our anything else as, as, as in any way, shape, or form um, a, 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 a condoning everything that I see or abrogating my responsibility. Uh, I know what my responsibility is. Well, I think the country would tank at 65 trillion, in all honesty. Uh, I think. You guys control that to make sure that it doesn't go up that high. We have a, we have a debt ceiling. So there is a limit, there is a debt limit uh, uh, that is in place according to law that is adjusted from time to time uh, that is supposed to control uh, the maximum amount of debt. Um, and uh, we're actually coming up on a huge vote on the debt ceiling uh, pretty soon um, because um, we're not allowed to go over that debt ceiling unless Congress says, and the president, by the way, so this is a two-stage thing. Both say we need to increase the debt. Now, that particular law has never had the desired effect, which is to actually limit the debt. Since that debt ceiling has been lifted uh, several times in the last uh, decades, uh, so it is obviously not functioning as an effective debt ceiling because people are making the judgment it's too hard uh, to make those decisions and it's too hard to simply arbitrarily cap it at a certain level when there are all these needs and lack of revenues, etc. I'm not defending it, just telling you it's always a, it's always a tough vote. But the, the direct answer to your question is yes, there is a debt ceiling, but not in the Constitution. I actually just uh, am about to go on a, on a, on a bill uh, that I was on the last time around, which again is a little bit of in the, falls in the level of frustration, but I think has some merit to it, and that is to require an actual balanced budget uh, for our country. And that would be a major sea change. Now there are exemptions in that bill for national emergencies, for needs, uh, for super majority votes that feel it's necessary to, to exceed a, a, a balanced budget from year to year. But at some point we're gonna have to find some measure of discipline uh, that has not uh, become evident uh, to date. 
Uh, we function fine under a balanced budget requirement in Hawaii. We don't realize we have it, but we've had it for decades. Um, we don't think about it all the time, but it exists and it actually has prevented excesses. I can tell you that as a former member of uh, the state legislature. There certainly have been um, efforts to quantify um, the, the um, economic consequences if we did not have that requirement. So in other words, folks that with pre-existing conditions did not get insurance, could not get insurance, at least adequate insurance, therefore they didn't get adequate health care, therefore they got very, very sick, therefore they, they, they required incredible amounts of help from other federal programs, and so uh, what then is the uh, benefit uh, to everybody, aside from the benefit to the person, but the benefit to everybody by saying, no, we're all in this together, we're all gonna share that risk, we all have some pre-existing conditions, or somebody close to us does, and we're gonna, we're gonna, pool, our res or we're gonna pool our risk, which evens out the cost to everybody. Okay, I thank you so much for the, this has been a great uh, last talk story. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a little while to answer uh, any of talks, talk further if you want, but uh, thank you very much. Well, all power with uh, my first uh, full session of uh, talk stories with Congressman Ed Case uh, throughout our district. It's been incredible just a couple of days. Uh, five straight talk stories across the district from East Honolulu uh, through Central Honolulu, Kalihi, Waipahu, and ending here in Eva Beach in Kapolei at uh, the Great Campbell High School. Uh, I've met so many incredible folks. Uh, every single one of our talk stories was very well attended. A great mix of folks uh, that uh, had different viewpoints on many different things, but they all had one concern. Uh, they all wanted uh, their government to function uh, better. Uh, they all wanted to uh, talk story with me a little bit about uh, what their thoughts were on uh, the right way forward uh, for our country and for our Hawaii. And I was able uh, to tell them a little bit uh, more about what I believe my responsibilities are in representing uh, the great first congressional district of, of Hawaii and what our office can do uh, for you as well as uh, just to open up and just listen. Uh, when you talk to that many people in that short a period of time from across a very, very diverse district, you, you form some uh, general uh, thoughts. Uh, and certainly for me, uh, the number one thought was that we all uh, need to stay on track uh, to find a better way to govern our country. Uh, everybody is concerned about how our country is uh, going. Um, obviously, we have major issues for our country, but the number one issue is how are we going to solve those major issues? And so for me, it was reinforcement uh, that uh, the steps that I and my colleagues in Congress have been taken uh, to try to find a better way forward are the right directions uh, for everybody. Uh, lots of individual ideas as well, and uh, we certainly uh, saw our phones and emails uh, light up from folks that uh, got the message that we're here to, to help. And there's many ways that uh, I and my uh, great staff uh, can help uh, as we go forward uh, throughout the next couple of uh, months that I have in my uh, two years on this office. Uh, so uh, on the screen you will be seeing uh, information on how you get in touch with us, um, but I'll tell you uh, again uh, the best way to enter into our office is uh, case.house.gov. That'll tell you everything about how to uh, get in touch with us and give your input. Um, I will look forward to the next series of talk stories in a few months. And of course, between now and then, uh, we'll be in touch and we'll always uh, have our office uh, open uh, to hear from you. So thank you very much uh, for watching and until uh, we uh, see each other, uh, aloha.